Hello. Hi, my name is Rizel Nung, and I'm a master's de degree candidate at the North Shore University Hospital LIU, School po LIU Post School of Cardiovascular Perfusion. And today I'll be describing the different cardioplegia temperatures and its effect on patients. I have no disclosures. As students were lectured by different surgeons around the New York metropolitan area. And at the end of one of these lectures with the surgeons, we talked about the different things that we've seen in our different rotation sites. Uh, when warm cardioplegic induction was described to the surgeon, he was intrigued and even a little surprised that this method was being practiced on bypass. He, of course, was used to the standard cold cardioplegia. He asked things like uh, where the surgeons were trained and what rotation site you're at now. And I found his surprise quite interesting. It told me that there is still a variety of perfusion practices out there that we may not all be familiar with. And so this experience sparked my uh, curiosity and it inspired me to look further into this warm induction technique. Interestingly enough, currently in the literature, there are debates over the benefits of different cardioplegia delivery temperatures. Temperature ranges include cold, tepid, or warm. Cold is less than eight degrees Celsius. Tepid or passive drift cooling ranges from 28 to 30 degrees Celsius. And warm cardioplegia may range from 36 to 37 degrees Celsius. A brief history on warm cardioplegia. Warm cardioplegia was first introduced by Buckberg and Associates in 1977. It was delivered as a hot shot uh, about three to five minutes before cross clamp removal and as a method to decrease the reperfusion injury that happens when, uh, after a cross clamp removal. Later in 1983, warm induction was developed by Rosencrantz and colleagues. Subsequently, uh, multi-dose multi -dose warm cardioplegia has been used throughout bypass. It has been used as the induction dose, the maintenance dose, and the final hot shot dose before cross clamp removal. More information on warm cardioplegia. In a meta-analysis of 41 randomized controlled trials that includes almost 6,000 patients, Fan and colleagues compared warm and cold cardioplegia. There is no significant difference in the outcomes uh, such as mortality, incidence of MI, incidence of balloon pump uh, between patients receiving warm cardioplegia and cold cardioplegia. Therefore, both techniques were deemed safe and effective methods for myocardial preservation. However, warm cardioplegia was associated with significantly improved post-operative cardiac index and reduced post-operative enzyme release. As Afra mentioned, Rosencrantz and colleagues developed warm induction using Buckberg cardioplegia. Uh, here are the components of Buckberg cardioplegia. You have potassium as the arresting agent, and key here in the Buckberg cardioplegia is the amino acids glutamate and aspartate. Uh, these key amino acids replenish Krebs cycle intermediates that are depleted in ischemic hearts. This concept of warm blood cardioplegia induction was based on the theory that the first dose of cardioplegia to the heart when deprived of blood flow was really the first phase of reperfusion. In their study, Buckberg and colleagues developed clinical data that uh, showed warm, warm blood induction results in two things. First, that uh, the it resulted in the active recovery of the heart, and second, it improved the heart's uh, tolerance to the subsequent period of ischemia. My study compares warm, warm and cold cardioplegic induction using the same standard cardioplegia in patients undergoing cabbages. Uh, the data was collected retrospectively from a cardiothoracic center in the New York City area. All 72 patients underwent isolated first-time cabbages. All patients uh, had two to three vessel coronary artery disease without valvular dysfunction. No other comorbidities, such as congestive heart failure, cerebrovascular disease, renal failure on dialysis, et cetera, were uh, re reported in these patients. Patients receiving warm or cold induction was based on surgeon preference. And as a result of this, all patients in the warm induction group were operated on by the same surgeon, Surgeon A, and all the patients in the cold induction group were operated on by the same surgeon, Surgeon B. As shown in table three 
uh, the 72 patients were split into two groups, 36 undergoing warm induction and 36 undergoing cold induction. Patient demographics and pre-bypass cardiac function are also displayed in Table 3. Pre-bypass cardiac function includes uh, the preoperative pre ejection fraction and the number of diseased vessels. Patient uh, demographics obtained include age, gender, and body surface area. The left internal mammary was used in all patients. All patients underwent routine systemic heparinization and bypass was established via an aortic cannula and a triple stage venous cannula in the right atrium. Bypass was performed using a heart lung machine, a Sorin S5, and a membrane oxygenator, it's a RUMO, a centrifugal pump, a Sorin Revolution, and a cardiac index of 1.8 to 2.4. Blood pressure on bypass was maintained between 40 and 80 millimeters of mercury. All patients were cooled to 34 degrees Celsius, and systemic removing was commenced during the last distal anastomosis. Proximal anastomoses were performed during cardioplegic arrest, and blood was transfused when hematocrit was 23 or less. For the cardioplegia delivery methods, in all patients, an aortic root cannula was placed into the aortic root and a retrograde cannula into the right atrium. Antigrate high potassium cardioplegia was administered immediately after cross clamping. The initial induction dose for all, uh, all patients was delivered antigrade using high potassium cardioplegia as shown in table four, table four uh, given warm or cold. Therefore, our method for warm induction is different from the Buckberg protocol in such that the cardioplegia used in this study uh, was not substrate enriched. Our cardioplegia only contains potassium and sodium bicarb. In the warm induction group, prior to initiation of bypass, the heater cooler cardioplegia system was set to 37 degrees Celsius. Initially, warm high potassium cardioplegia was given antigrade with a roller pump flow rate of 250 to 300 cc's per minute until an arrest was achieved. After warm induction, the heater cooler was, was switched to cold cardioplegia, and cold cardioplegia was at, delivered at 4 to 8 degrees Celsius, given antigrade and or retrograde. Before the release of the cross clamp, warm 37 degrees whole blood was given. In the cold induction group, uh, the heater cooler cardioplegia system was set to 2 degrees Celsius prior to the initiation of bypass. Cold high potassium cardioplegia was given antigrade with a roller pump flow rate of 250 to 300 cc's per minute. And here is a summary of the methods used on bypass. We had the three, uh, three phases of the cardioplegia delivery. Uh, and of course, the only difference between the, the two phases were the induction dose. So warm was given warm and cold was given cold. Maintenance doses were in both groups were given cold. And the reperfusion dose of whole blood was given warm. Also worth noting that all patients during the re reperfusion dose receive 100 milligrams of lidocaine and two grams of magnesium. And here are my results. Uh, I measured bypass time, cross clamp time, post op EF by TEE and change in EF. Uh, the p-value was significant in all groups, uh, meaning so both groups had similar outcomes. And here's the graphical representation. Uh, aortic cross clamp time and change in EF. And I also went on to measure the perioperative cardioversions and periop lidocaine and blood transfusions. Again, uh, statistical significance was not found between the two groups. Uh, here are the lidocaine dosages. Uh, both, in both groups, the amount of lidocaine averaged out to a little over 100 milligrams. And in the cardioversions, this is the percent of patients that were cardioverted. And again, uh, both groups yielded similar outcomes. And then the final things that I measured were the post-op vent time, the length of stay in the ICU, and the overall length of stay. And again, I found nothing significant. So based on the results, there was no statistical difference between the two groups. Uh, Wallace and Associates had similar conclusions using buffered cardioplegia. They found that there was no prolonged clinically significant benefit to warm induction over cold induction with Buckberg cardioplegia. They did, however, note increases in LV systolic function. However, improvements were transient. 
Further research is needed, specifically a larger sample size because this is such a small, sam uh, small sample study. Uh, I only have an N of 72 patients. And in addition to increasing sample size, uh, I propose uh, measuring cardiac enzymes such as cardiac troponin I, cardiac troponin T, and creatine phosphokinase. Uh, all of these will be measured preoperatively, postoperatively, and perioperatively. Uh, the cardiac troponins are very sensitive and specific indicators of damage to the myocardium. They'll be increased in all patients after cardiac surgery. They are increased in all patients after cardiac surgery, showing the inevitable myocardial damage caused by myocardial arrest. Cardiac troponin eye measurements can detect small differences in myocardial tissue damage, and it is used to detect myocardial injury in research. Creatine phosphokinase is a ca cardiac marker used to assist diagnosis in acute MI. Uh, MI requires a creatine phosphokinase MB enzyme concentration greater than or equal to the threshold of 100 units per liter. So these, th all of these uh, markers were measured in papers that were trying to measure the difference between warm and cold induction. And that's it. I would like to thank Richard Chan, Program Director of the North Shore LIU CW Post School of Cardiovascular Perfusion. I'd like to thank Perfusion.com for allowing me to present today. And thank you for listening. Mm -hmm. <laughs>